I guess, Roy, we should um, we should make a start. Um, yep. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I know that there's uh, there may maybe some people that are going to join us in um, in a few minutes, but we've got a good list of people that have joined already. So welcome, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm sure we're all keen to hear what our customers and members are thinking about for the next season. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm Angus McKeever. I'm the general manager of the Ski Club of Great Britain. I'm sure a lot of you know about the Ski Club, but uh, as a, a very brief intro, the Ski Club has been around since 1903. And contrary to any vague rumours, I've not been a member for the whole time since then, <laughs> but I have been a member for quite a while. Um, and it's, it was set up with uh, the way that we define it now, with the broad aim of helping people make the most of their time in the mountains, uh, with a particular focus, obviously, on alpine skiing and snowboarding. We have uh, over 22,000 members, and like many of you, we're recovering from the last season's end, unexpectedly early end. Um, and um, you may be interested to know that we've just launched our holiday program. Uh, we launch it in July each year, uh, which I know is a little unusual, but uh, that's when we launch our Fresh Tracks program to our members. Uh, good news is so far we're actually, uh, we've actually got some strong early bookings and our members in particular seem to be very keen to get themselves booked on the holidays that they, they want to go on. In addition to that, we, as usual, we're sending our representatives out to 18 resorts um, across the Alps uh, and into the Rockies this year. Um, and that encourages UK skiers to go to those resorts that we send representatives to, look them up on the website because of the presence of the reps. And just by their presence, those reps contribute hundreds of thousands of euros in revenue to the, re the resorts that they go to. This is the eighth year that we've organized the survey and this year has had a very strong response. Thanks to many of you on the call, um, you did uh, a fantastic job of, of communicating to your customers and we had over 19,000 responses. Thanks also to our sponsors, so the Austrian National Tourist Office, Force 24, who are a marketing automation business, Wild Dog, who are a design agency specialising in the travel industry. Thank you very much for sponsoring this and making it happen. And thank you too to Snow and Rock and Salomon for the prizes that they provided to encourage people to take part. We're doing this debrief a lot earlier than we've done it in previous years. I know this would normally be a breakfast or a dinner in October. But we felt that this year in particular, it was really important that we do it early because it gives us some information of what, what consumers and uh, travellers are hoping to do for this season. So that's why we're doing it now. We thought we'd get it out as soon as we got it. Um, we, uh, the way that we're going to run it is I've, I've just finished an introduction, nearly finished an introduction. Uh, I'm going to hand over in a moment to Roy from Spike Insight. And uh, with, through, as he goes through the research findings, you'll see uh, that there's a button that says Q&A. And so if you want to ask any questions of us, click on the Q&A button and you can type out a question and we'll save them to the end of the presentation and answer whatever question you have, whether it's about the presentation itself or about um, anything else uh, to do with um, skiing um, and, the, and the travel industry and skiing, then, then feel, feel free to ask. We may not know the answers, but we'll give them a go. Um, so that's the Q&A button. Um, and then at the very end, I, I'll, I'll come back to um, talk about uh, and, you know, the follow-up to this uh, and explain what we're doing to follow up to it. So right now, without any further ado, I'll hand over to Roy from Spike Insight, uh, and they've produced and analysed the results of the survey for us, and Roy will take you through the results. Over to you. Uh, good morning, uh, and thank you, Angus, and, and also thank you, Daisy, at the Ski Club, for all the hard work that you've put in to making this project a success, and, and also thank you, everybody, uh, on this Zoom call. Um, I'm Roy Barker. Uh, I'm a director of Spike and um, as Angus said we've worked with the Ski Club since 2013 um, helping them with the Ski Club annual consumer research and um, we've also worked with um, quite a few ski businesses, tourist boards, 
and even airports and resorts to help them use this data to understand the needs, wants and potential amongst UK skiers. Um, our mission as a business in general is to help you grow your travel business faster using data that makes sense. And um, typically that uh, is not only data from research as here, um, but data from transactional systems, reservation systems, data gathered from online interactions. And we think, and uh, we thought 10 years ago when we set Spike up, that there's a massive untapped potential for travel businesses to use the data more effectively. And more so now than ever, really, um, to improve targeting, you know, making sure any money you're spending is um, giving you the right um, the right bang for the book, uh, but also you know in terms of product development and um, smarter acquisition and retention. Um, but today, um, this is uh, all about the ski club consumer research. I'm going to talk to you for about half an hour, maybe 40 minutes, uh, and then, as Angus said, we've got time for question and discussion at the end. Um, the agenda for the day. Uh, I'm going to start with some background on the survey and how it works, uh, who responded, um, what they look like, uh, what their experience of potentially having had their holidays interrupted by the pandemic was like. Uh, then we're going to look at some key findings and I can really only scratch the surface here, um, although what we're going to show I think is, is, is interesting. Um, there's masses of data we've collected. And, um, you know, this is quite a substantial questionnaire. Um, some people answer up to 50 questions, but because skiers are enthusiastic and, um, you know, they, they want to help the industry, um, we've gathered a lot of data. And please, if there's anything your organisation wants to know, um, do contact us and we'll see what we can do for help from the data that we've gathered not only from this year but from the past 10 years as well. So after the key findings we're going to look at net promoter scores and that's the method we use to rank resorts, countries, airlines and tour operators and then finally and I think you will agree most interestingly uh, future intentions and I'm sorry to have to make you wait till the end to find that out um, but we're going to look at um, how many people want to go skiing next season uh, where do they want to go and what does future demand actually look like as uh, we move forward in um, the, the new normal as it is uh, being called, although I did promise I was going to use that word. Um, so uh, the survey itself, um, the methodology is um, that um, the ski club partners with uh, a number of participating organisations um, we develop um, a, a unique um, online link um, which the participating organisation distributes and that typically um, is via email although they may distribute that via social media as well. Um, as um, a, a reward for distribution um, they get their own report and data so you know they get professional standard market research against their own customers and then uh, we collate the anonymized data into um, a, a larger um, base of information and then we analyze that on behalf of the ski club and this is the first uh, first point of um, that uh, analysis uh, that we're showing today. So um, how many responses did we get? Um, well, almost 20,000 responses, uh, which I think you'd agree is a pretty substantial um, sample. There were 28 participating organisations from tour operators, travel agents, and um, tourist boards, retailers, and um, we got a broad spread of the market by doing that. And um, we think the survey was distributed, we estimate, um, to about a million people. Um, but what is most key about this data is that it's current. And um, this chart shows when that data was collected. Um, some of it is just a few weeks old. Um, it's data that was gathered um, when people knew the full extent of the pandemic and the effect it was having on life and travel. So um, it's good, strong, current information. 
Throughout the presentation, um, you'll see us mentioning um, the Net Promoter Score or NPS. Um, this uh, is not something uh, Spike developed. Um, it was actually developed by um, Bain and Co. and Satmetrics, and um, they have um, allowed anybody to use it really. And it's now used as a as a global measure of um, customer satisfaction, loyalty and advocacy. And you will probably have seen this question yourselves in um, questionnaires you've, you, you've responded to. The form of the question is, um, how likely would you be to recommend um, a brand activity uh, location to a friend or colleague? And then um, you are asked to score that likelihood from zero, which is not at all likely, to 10, which is extremely likely. And um, the uh, responses are then um, split into three. Nines and tens are known as promoters, and they are very strong advocates of um, brand or activity. Um, seven or eight are passives, they're still keen, but um, they might be open to doing other things. And six and below are known as detractors who potentially um, detract from, from your brand. The score itself is calculated by taking the percent of promoters, the percent of those scoring you nine and ten, and subtracting the percent of detractors, those that are scoring you zero to six. Um, the key findings. The timing of the survey um, allowed us to ask some, some very topical questions. Uh, and the first of those uh, I'm going to look at uh, is this. Was your holiday affected by the disruption caused by the coronavirus pandemic? And um, yes, it was for about a quarter of our respondents. So, you know, a pretty substantial sample there. We then went on to ask this group, particularly those that had traveled with a ski operator or travel agent, how would you rate the help and support provided by your ski operator or travel agent? And this was, a, this was asked in that zero to 10 scale NPS format I mentioned earlier. So a zero would be uh, the help and support provided uh, was very poor, and a 10 would be the help and support provided was extremely good. Overwhelmingly, the response was positive to what ski operators and travel agencies did. 81% <coughs> excuse me, responded positively, with regard to the help and support they got, only 13% responded negatively. And almost half rated their operators 9 and 10 for help and support. And that was from a sample of over a thousand people. So, you know, I think those people that are in the uh, ski operator travel agent environment can feel pretty proud of what they were able to do for those people that were affected by the pandemic. Um, one thing we know about skiers, and we've known almost throughout the, the time we've been involved in the ski industry, is that skiers tend to be a very enthousi enthusiastic advocates for the activity. And um, one of the other key questions we ask is how likely would you be to recommend a skiing holiday to a friend or colleague? And this proves the same every year it generally comes out at about 81, 82 as a net promoter score. And it doesn't really get much better than that. It's, kind of, it's, it's almost impossible to um, gain better scores than, than the low 80s. 84% of the people that responded to this question are promoters. That is, they said, nine, they scored nine or 10 at their likelihood to recommend a skiing holiday very strong advocates. Um, there's a few passives, uh, a few percent there sitting on the fence, uh, and then we've got two and a half percent that wouldn't recommend a skiing holiday to a friend or colleague. Um, and what we also do with these questions is ask them why they gave that score. And um, there we gather a whole set of verbatim comments and um, we can analyze that and look at the reasons people give for being, being a detractor in this instance. Most of the detractors uh, are actually not uh, denigrating skiing holidays in any way. 
um, what they tend to say is um, a lot of my friends would ski or I've already told them all about it uh, or even I'm not the type of person to recommend things nobody is saying that they don't enjoy skiing holidays finding a way to mobilize that advocacy would be great for the ski industry and I don't necessarily have the answer to that um, but it's a bit like the problem Guinness had in the 1980s um, everybody liked and admired it as a brand and a product the people who drank it loved it um, but they couldn't persuade anybody who wasn't already drinking it to taking it up um, a challenge for the industry and really you know that's kind of reflected when we start asking people how many weeks have you skied in total it's skewed um, very much towards the top end and um, if you look there we've compared 2018 to 2020 we've got very few people who have skied one week or less very few people who are entrants into the market um, we've got a lot of people who have skied 30 weeks or more and um, in the short term um, I think everybody would agree that we don't really see any growth coming from new entrants to the market um, particularly in the current circumstances um, but there may be the opportunity to switch people from the independent sector particularly given how enthusiastic people have been about how that sector helped them in the crisis and we've also got some other evidence a little later to support that that we think there might be a swell of people wanting to switch into the um, security and um, safety of um, traveling with a tour operator so um, when did people sorry who did people go with um, on their last ski break well skiing as you know is a very sociable activity and most people are going with friends family and groups i can't really speculate here about how some of those party compositions may be affected next season um, but i would think that the family and couples market is is, is pretty resilient um, and you know from everything we're seeing uh, one would hope um, that the um, the ski resorts will be open and they'll be able to accommodate people in in a relatively normal fashion where had people skied um, France, Austria, Italy, um, Switzerland, uh, with the other markets forming along the tail. Um, but on top of this, um, we know where people went, uh, we know which resort they went to, and we know how they rated that resort, not just on a net promoter score, but in on, on 10 or 12 other factors in, in very precise detail. That's not something for today, um, but it may be something of interest to some of the operators in terms of uh, being able to um, look at how resorts are favoured or not by different parts of the market. In terms of gender, um, again, this stays pretty constant over the years, about 60% male and about 40% female. And, um, you know, when we've looked at the age breaks on that, um, we see that you get more um, younger females, it, they tend to drop out of the market in the 30s and 40s and there's always an opportunity for bringing those back over time. Age is the other thing um, that I know is um, a concern for the market um, and this also shows a persistent um, picture over the years. It's, it's a mature and maturing market. Um, again, um, it might concern some people, uh, but at the moment, uh, we don't think this is an issue. And, and we believe in the short term, uh, it's not a problem, but in the long term it is. We need to make sure skiing remains relevant to younger age groups. Uh, but um, as I said, all, all is not doom and gloom on the age front. Um, because if you look at the UK population in 2019, um, demographics are currently on our side. Uh, 50 to 59 is a pretty large age cohort, um, particularly compared with the 10 years either side. So um, for now, I'd happily take 
a wealthy, resilient, dedicated age cohort, rather than trying to recruit from the younger and less affluent. And um, to put some of that into perspective, 75% um, of the total wealth of the nation is owned by those aged 45 to 74. And they really pretty much at the moment account for the lion's share of the ski market. So um, that's what uh, people look like. Um, but we also wanted to find out how they'd been affected economically by, by the current situation. So another topical question we were able to ask is, how do you expect the general economic situation in this country to develop over the next 12 months and this this is one we um, borrowed from the office of uh, national S statistics so this is something they're tracking as well and and um, we've used it across a, a lot of surveys in different parts of the market as well and we see a pretty consistent picture here most people um, think things will get worse or a lot worse um, there are some optimists um, but they're rather outweighed by the pessimists uh, in a way um, I think most people would probably agree with that but what is more interesting is how people think their own situation will be um, how their micro economic climate will be as, as, as things move forward and for this we ask how do you expect the financial position of your household change over the next 12 months and here we start seeing the resilience really of the core ski market and only three percent say their position will get a lot worse 70 percent say it will remain the same or get better and um, two and a half percent say it's going to get a lot better um, I, I imagine they they probably own online supermarkets or uh, or zoom even similar organizations and um, 25 percent say it will get a little worse and given how committed these people are to skiing one would hope um, that that means they will still go on a skiing holiday so we think people will probably have the means to go and um, but what's their attitude to risk and um, in order to assess that and um, we use the adoption curve um, and you may have seen this before again it, it shows typically how new innovations are adopted but it works re equally as well for, for the re-adoption of travel and um, people can be innovators the very first to go early adopters um, late majority sorry early majority late majority or laggards and um, to see how the ski market fits into the re-entry curve we asked the following question which of the following best matches your attitude to traveling on holiday abroad in the future and um, we were quite general here because we've been collecting data on this um, from other markets as well um, at the far left you've got uh, i'll be amongst the first to travel the innovators uh, then you've got uh, once i feel the time is right i'll start to travel again uh, right the way down to the laggards who don't think they'll be traveling again we didn't get any of those uh, in other markets we have um, and the vast majority of skiers here fit into the innovator and early adopter categories um, that more than 25 percent say they will be the first to travel is pretty remarkable um, in other markets the best we've seen is 12 to 15 percent you know I, I think skiers skiers are brave and they are adventurous and in total, um, of the 11,500 responders who went skiing last year, 90% of them say they'll be in, in the travel vanguard. Again, positive news. Um, I mentioned a little earlier um, that um, we had been uh, gathering net promoter scores on people. And um, this is that 0 to 10 score. I mean, use that to quantify preferences and to be able to rank a wide range of parts of the ski holiday experience and uh, i'm going to take you through a few of those the first we're going to look at is is airlines and um, quite a range here um 
from a kind of world class 53 to a bottom of the class minus 43. And I think you can probably guess who came top. Uh, they tend to come top every year. That's Swiss. And the bottom is um, where it is every year as well, really, which is, which is Ryanair. Um, and the one next to that is Flybe. But overall, the airline experience has improved since 2018. Uh, and it stands at uh, 9.3. Whereas in um, 2018, it was it, it was actually standing at zero. Excuse me a minute. <coughs> the next part we're looking at is airports, and this is destination airport. And uh, similarly, quite a spread. Um, top marks here goes to Zurich, uh, and bottom marks to Chambray and Grenoble, um, taking the rear positions there, unfortunately. And the average has improved again. So 2008, um, overall airports were at minus 17.9. Uh, now they're at minus 7.8. Countries, um, Canada and USA leading the pack uh, with Eastern Europe at the tail end there. Um, though even an MPS of 21 is, is, you know, is far from disastrous. But when you start looking at things resort by resort, you can see a far wider spread. So um, here we've looked at uh, resorts where we got more than 100 responses. Uh, and at the top, we, we, we've got Banff, which um, uh, typically has, uh, together with Whistler, been um, towards the top of these uh, rankings. Um, at the bottom, uh, we've got Bansko. Um, but it's interesting to see that um, after Banff, um, we get Zermatt and Val d'Isère. Uh, Whistler comes in fourth, and then at five, we've got Val Turin. So, you know, the European resorts are, you know, pretty, pretty much up there as well. Um, next, we have the uh, hotly contested uh, operator NPS score. And um, here, uh, we've got a top score of... Um, 82 and a bottom score of minus four. Uh, I'm not going to um, mention who the minus four is, although we might contact them independently um, and um, have a quick chat with them. Um, the top on 82 is um, Ski Safari. So um, congratulations there. I think that's um, several years. Um, you've come out top uh, and, and, and we'll be releasing more of these results soon. And um, Angus, um, you'll be glad to know that Fresh Tracks did very well as well. They were certainly within the top five and uh, significantly above average. Um, another way we looked at um, operators was by um, tour operator size and um, from small, medium to large. Um, again, uh, we averaged out the net promoter scores there. Uh, you know, the, the one that seems to be performing best this year is uh, the medium-sized operator um, who I think have been able to combine um, scale um, with um, personalization. And um, that seems to be quite a, a sweet spot of, of the market. Although small and large by no means uh, are poor net promoter schools. Um, I'm, I'm going to finish uh, with a few slides on what people told us they would like to do next season. And um, the future intentions question um, was, was moderated slightly this year by saying, if it is possible, do you intend to go skiing next season? Uh, for which we got a pretty remarkable 96.7 of people who skied last season wanted to ski next season. So that's a sample of about 14,000 people. We think that is very positive. If they can do it, they will do it. Um, but we also thought, well, uh, what if we looked at those people who had been negatively affected by coronavirus? Um, perhaps they would be more reticent. Not so. 98.3% of a sample of almost 3,000 people whose holiday last season was disrupted 
said they intend to go skiing next season. Um, pretty impressive. And um, we also, um, every year, ask about uh, longer term, um, who thinks they will be skiing more, less or the same over the next three years? Um, most people um, will stay the same. So you've got something like 65% say, yeah, you know, what, what I've been doing in the past, I'll be doing in the future. Um, we've got 9% say they'll do less uh, and 26% say um, their skiing habits are going to increase. From that, um, we create a what we call a, um, a net uplift. So we take the um, percent of decliners away from the percent of increases. And um, this year, we've got a pretty impressive potential demand uplift of about 16 and a half percent. Um, but that's actually a drop from what we saw in 2018. Um, there was more desire to ski more in 2018. But even so, 16.5% potential uplift, uh, potential demand, um, is, is, is pretty impressive, really. Um, and the other piece, we asked people, um, do you think you are going to be skiing more with a tour operator or travel agent and of those people that had booked independently 23 percent of the market said they would be likely or highly likely to change their habit to book with a tour operator or travel agent which you know 23 percent of what looks, I'm going to uh, multiple percents here. We think about 40% of, of the market uh, books independently. So being able to get a, a, a quarter of them to come back to tour operators and travel agents would be a very powerful thing. Um, the other thing um, we do is look at a steel matrix. So a steel matrix is about finding about where people went last and where they're likely to go next. So um, along the top, we have where are you most likely to ski uh, and along the side we've got where was your last ski holiday so the first one is andorra and if you read that down um 54 percent of the people who went to andorra next last year are likely to go back to andorra but austria is going to take six percent of them france is going to take 18 percent italy and so on and so forth and that you know gives you a nice feel for for how the market shifts um, France has the largest retention rate at 79%. Um, they're losing about 7% to Austria, 1% to Andorra and so forth. Um, uh, France has the greatest retention rate because it has the greatest variety of places you can ski really, but you know, other markets do pretty well to um, maintain it, you know, mid fifties in terms of people returning year on year. And we can also see that um, as, uh, as a broader picture um, with more markets and a, a copy of this um, presentation is going to be sent to you if, if you want to look at that in, in more detail. So to, to summarise what, what, what we've got here, um, I, I think um, you know the enthusiasm for ski remains uh, undaunted. Um, I think it's a market that is more likely to um, continue it's not going to get affected by the economic headwinds as much as other parts of the market and um, if possible 98 percent of those people who went skiing last year intend to go skiing next uh, so, um, so there's been and answers. there's a there's a couple of questions right um toby's yep. asked do we have any stats about extras such as ski schools and whether people would be taking extras next year or uh, would would they tighten their belt and be dropping the the ski school outings um, um yeah i think that's a very good question we we know um who took ski school and um other extras uh, last year for, from their last ski holiday 
Um, we didn't ask them about their future intention on those things, but I think we can look at um, comparing that against how they think their economic position is going to be. And that would give us a pretty good indicator of um, how that part of the market's going to fare. I mean, it's probably fair to say at the moment, we're not seeing the people that want to go skiing talking about cutting down on their skiing activities. They basically yeah. want to do what they've done. You know, they, they're talking about maybe altering the way that they're booking so that they get some more protection. But I haven't seen um, something that says there would be a significant decline um, in them wanting to get instruction if they got instruction before but so th there's nothing to indicate that um, I, I guess that's where we'd be on it another question how have past predictions about net uplift matched ac actual market size increases is it a predictive <laughs> model Roy can you guarantee that it's going to go up by 13 percent I haven't got I haven't got the AI algorithm to, to guarantee it um, what I can say is it's a you know it's a latent demand um, people say they want to do things uh, and they get distracted by all sorts of, 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 of other things coming towards them. But, uh, you know, it's the job of sales and marketing to get in front of those people and um, persuade them from a latent intent to, to actually doing something. Yeah, I think, I think the, it's, it's not a predictive. It just gives you an idea that people are certainly intending to do something um, about going skiing and they'd love to go. That's all it's telling you. Uh, yeah. I, I don't think you would be able to translate it into a market growth um, algorithm on this, in this kind of research. Um, were any questions uh, uh, Brexit related, Roy? Do people um, think that it will affect their ski holidays in the next season? We didn't, we didn't, we didn't do Brexit this year. No. Yeah. Um, so sorry about that. We're making perhaps the foolish assumption that uh, it's not going to make that much of a difference to people's desire to travel um, to Europe and it's not putting them off. But of course, nobody quite knows what they're going to have to do in order to go. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, we go other places and have uh, and have uh, electronic visas. If that's what we need to get to Europe, I don't think that's going to put people off. But. Um, we didn't ask. Is there any insight into what type of accommodation people will be choosing next season? Uh, there was a bit actually yep. on that, wasn't there, yep. Roy? So there do, you wanna, yep. do you want to answer that? Yeah, I mean, we haven't put the data in here, but that exists. Yeah, that people are, more, how more likely are people to um, choose different types of accommodation, um, you know, hotels, self-catering, chalets, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, we can, we can get that data together. Um, I think it was a bit of a surprising result. I think it related a little bit to going on package holidays um, that my memory was that there was more people thinking about going to um, accommodation such as hotels uh, than, um, than self-catering. So I think uh, an assumption that people were making is that there'd be a growth in self-catering as people tried to uh, isolate themselves a bit more for COVID, but that didn't appear to be the trend that they were um, that, that they put in the research that's my memory yeah. of it but but you you know we, we'll be able to put in a slide somewhere on that I think elsewhere in the market there is you know a, a trend towards um, um, larger hotel brands as well because people yeah. think they trust their um, their processes more than um, you know a small independent I don't know I almost saw it as, I mean, the same sort of next question, do you have any stats regarding the type of accommodation, type of ski holiday you'll be keen to go on? Um, it, so we saw a trend towards um, catered and um, hotels away from self-catering, I think. But it's, but, you know, who, who knows whether that will actually translate into what people do. But that at the moment seemed to be what they were saying. Um, so the, what we're unsure about from a ski club point of view, I mean, a lot of our holidays are group holidays. All of our holidays are group holidays and many of them have shared rooms. And we're, um, we're interested to see what people think of that kind of, um, that kind of holiday option um, in the world of COVID. So uh, at the moment, it, it, you know, it doesn't seem to be put, put people off booking, but we'll find out the closer we get to it. 
Do we have any idea of what people will expect in terms of COVID protection and if that's the reason why they're interested in Turot? Um, Roy, have you got anything else that you want to add on COVID protection? We, 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 we didn't get that close in this survey to um, you know, what, what people um, might expect or what they might get. Um, we are looking, and, and Angus will explain this, you know, we, we're looking at some um, updates, pulse surveys, because the world is, is changing very rapidly. Um, you know, everybody thought they could go to Spain a few weeks ago and now they can't. Um, and, you know, even the idea of going on holiday, we, we were asking questions a few weeks ago about when people imagined they might be able to go on holiday again. And, um, you know, we've got um, people in people in Switzerland now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm calling from Switzerland. Um, the yeah, so. Uh, the, there wasn't anything specific about what they expected to have in place. Um, I think it's probably it was probably a bit early because I'm not sure people were very clear on what they expected anyway. But all we were, the impression that we were getting from the survey is that despite COVID, people were saying, well, as long as I'm allowed to travel, I want to travel. Yeah. In terms of how they want to travel, mode of transport, um, really, the, the, uh, the, there was a mode of transport question, um, and uh, uh, my memory, Roy, was that people were generally going to do the same thing as they did last year. Uh, there wasn't yeah. really a change in mode of transport. Yeah, pretty much. So I yeah. can't remember how many perc what percentage of people said they were going to travel by the train. Do we have a do we've we have a number that, for that? Yeah, we've got the, well, we've got how many people? Yeah, we have. We've got stats on that. There wasn't a big shift most yeah. people still imagine they're going to be flying yeah um so yeah ian we may we, we can look out the percentage number for you and um, i'm sure we can can answer yeah. that specific question about what percentage want to travel by train yeah um and Anne williams the stats are encouraging that 98 percent intend to ski this winter but bookings do not reflect that any insights into why they haven't committed to book yet there was a there was a question about booking intention and at what time of year they expected to book. Um, uh, can you remember what people were saying? Yeah, yeah I think we only asked when when they booked previously. I mean, I I, I think um, I think that's something we should be asking ongoing. Really, yeah. I, I think if we asked people a month ago when they thought they might book, it it, it shifts around massively. The closer you get to it, you know, I think post, you know, post August, probably people are starting to get more, you know, more um, definite about what their plans might be. Yeah, my, my, I think there was a question on it. Um, we didn't get a particular insight out of it. I'm yeah. guessing, as I'm sure everybody's guessing, that people are wanting to be a little bit more open on when they're going to book this year than perhaps in previous years just to find out you know is it all going to happen are the resorts going to run is skiing going to happen and uh, and waiting a little bit later in the season we've certainly asked our members that question and we had a shift from people that historically would have booked in july and august saying they were going to wait until later in the year to see the lay of the land they still intended to book but they were going to book later um so to help with that if there's no other questions, what uh, what Roy um, and Spike are going to do for us is we're going to run two more intention surveys, one in September and one just before the season in November, to ask specifically about uh, about intention to book. So, have you booked, and do you in, intend to book? Um, uh, so the the um, that, so we're gonna we're gonna have um, uh, that sort of um, finger on the pulse of people's intentions over the next couple of months, so that we can give you some more information about the way that people are thinking about how they're going to book their holidays if they're going to book their holidays. So that's September and November, and we'll publish those results to you. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've recorded the webinar. 
Um, so we'll be able to give you access to a link of, of the webinar if you want to share it with somebody who wasn't here. Um, we'll give you a copy of the slides. And we've also got our friends at Wild Dog um, who are producing a visually interesting summary infographic. I think that's how one describes it. And hopefully that will, that will give some, uh, some visuals if you wanted to share this with people that are interesting. And uh, we'll send that out at the beginning of next week um, so that you have access to that pack. And if there's any other questions, clearly uh, you can fire us an email. And, and um, if there's anything else that you need to follow up on, we will do our best. So that's everything from me. Is there anything from you, Roy, that I've missed that you wanted to add? No, I think that's you know. It, ask ask us questions. If if there's stuff you want to know, ask us. And if you want you know influence those surveys, we're going to be running later in the year. Yeah, you know, ask us what you want to know. Tell us what you want to know. Sorry. Good. Yeah, and we can we can include some maybe shorter survey, but but yeah. we want to get it's more about. Uh, 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 booking intentions uh, is the main thing we do. We could ask something about ski schools in, in that. So do you intend uh, to book ski schools as well? So that, that could be interesting. So we might think about adding that question. Yeah. Um, if there's no more open questions and nothing else from you, Roy, um, I'll okay. let, um, let everybody go. And, um, and thank you very much indeed for joining us. I hope you have a successful end of the week, good weekend, and I look forward to seeing the pack when it comes out next week. Goodbye now. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye.